Li Yao, early spring, His Majesty visits the southern villa of the Princess Taiping. Our host's mountain mansion appears, touching the very sky. The Son of Heaven on spring excursion comes, shaking the earth. Here and there see horse guards circle beyond the flowers. Rainbow banners flap in the breeze, turning beside the sun. Have this stony rill playing concert with the tunes of the lute, and take red clouds from peaks to fill our cups of wine. The bird belt coach has left the aisles of magpies and of rooks, yet sounds of their piping still swirls around Phoenix Terrace. So we have a poem here by Li Jiao, and uh, we should start by introducing this figure. Now, Li Jiao is an early Tang writer. He had a quite long life, second half of the 7th century and first decades of the 8th century. And he was rather successful as a, a scholar official. Uh, he, he passed examinations pretty young, served in the court of Empress Wu, and became one of the most appreciated court poets at her court, one of those very high representatives of the court poetry style, so, you know, hand in hand with uh, the slightly younger Shen Chuanqi, uh, Song Shi Wen, Du Shenzhen, the whole group of courtly poets of that are very representative of the early Tang court poetry. And he had his ups and downs in, 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 in his politics. He was very close to one of uh, Wu Zetian's favorites. He then fell a little bit, recovered uh, positions under Emperor Chongzong. But then finally, uh, during the reigns of Zhuizong and Xuanzong, he was practically banished to a minor position in the periphery. But before that, he had achieved the highest posts or, or some of the highest posts in the court hierarchy, being made a, a grand counselor a couple of times and even having been ennobled with uh, the du a duke's title. Okay, so um, as a poet, uh, quite a lot of his poems have been preserved, about 200 or so. Half of them are Yun Wu Shi, there's poems describing things. And the first thing I have to say is actually to justify why am I including him here. Because, you know, he is relatively important as an early Tang poet, but he's not really that important. You know, the, the evaluation and assessment of early Tang poetry by, by the, the Tang poets themselves is pretty harsh. There's this uh, a very, very cruel remark by Li Shangjing, in a poem of his, in which he says that, well, basically those early town poets were pretty good at making parallel couplets, and that's it. So, so, so this is a very condescending view, but it does encapsulate the idea that um, later Tang writers and um, later readers and writers from other periods of Chinese history, and, and Stephen Owen in his book, The Poetry of the Early Tang, implies just as much that these early poets were not too interesting. They were, they, they were very important for developing the form of uh, what, what would become regulated poetry and uh, for, for, for continuing and, in a way, leading to a certain flourishing, the, the, the old um, court poetry that had developed in the, in the period of this union. And also for the first, for the first uh, uh, intimations of the new sort of, of, of uh, morally serious poetry that uh, the opposition poetics of the early Tang dynasty had attempted unsuccessfully to, to develop. So question is, we have in the anthology poems by Shen Xuanqi and uh, and uh, Zhong Xiwen. Why do we need another poem by another relatively bland? Uh, court poet? Well, I would say Li 
Xiao has some nice poems. The one I read today is not the best, or at least not the one I like the most, but it's definitely the more representative of his style. So that's why I've chosen it instead of one of the Jung Wuxi or one of the historical uh, poems imitating, talking about Ubisund or uh, old palaces and ruins or, or in the ballad style, which are more to my taste, but probably are less representative than, than this poem. And he is included, he's not included in 300 Tang poems, but he is included in poems from the masters. In fact, and the poem is, that, that is included there is in this style, and it's not a bad poem. In fact, I distinctly remember it. It was also a poem like this of, of Li Qi Yao attending a banquet of a princess, one of uh, Emperor Chong Song's daughter, and also describing the villa and the celebrations. But he, he, he did quite a nice job in, in that other poem, and so, so I remember it fondly, but the, the, the mere fact that I remember it uh, out of a collection of, of 200, 300 poems is significant. And anyway, he also appears in the bibliographic dictionary of Tang scholar, uh, scholar poets that was recently being published by uh, William Nienhauser. Okay, so enough with the introductions and the preambles, we've decided to read a poem of his. Now, what can we say about this poem? Well, this poem is part of a cycle. Remember, the type of court poetry that was very popular in the Six Dynasties and the early Tang was very frequently poetry made to imperial command. The emperor um, had a banquet or, or visited somebody, and uh, he ordered the poems, the court poems, to compose some verses celebrating the occasion, and generally banquets and celebrations. Uh, so, so it's a pretty conventional type of poetry, and it also follows very rigid structures and forms. Generally, these poems start with a couplet that describes the the the, 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 the time and place that introduces us to the topic of we're going to have this banquet in such and such a place at such and such a time. Then the second and third couplets are rigidly parallelistic, and they are descriptive. They describe the pleasures, natural, cultural, and social, and the views that are enjoyed at the party, with very, very typical conventional images, beautiful mountains, lakes, rivers, drinking, celebrating, luxurious um, clothes, and, um, and carriages and uh, happiness, and, and uh, quaffing, and uh, singing galore. And the last couplet uh, generally tells how the party ends, how the people leave, with a note on sadness, on, or sometimes it's like, oh, people don't want to leave and they linger a little bit, or their hearts felt like they wanted to linger, but they had to go away. Now this poem, is completely in line with, with such a poetry. And as I said, I think it's part of a, a series of seven out of eight, uh, seven surviving poems of, of a, a group of eight under the same title, Early Spring, His Majesty Visits the Southern Vale of the Princess Taiping, written on the 11th day of the second month, 709. We don't need to know much about the princess uh, Taiping. She was um, a sister of Emperor Chongzong, a daughter of uh, Wu Zetian, and much like her mother, she was a very strong-willed and uh, powerful woman. Uh, she, during the reign of, after the death of, of, of Chongzong, she became all powerful almost uh, during the brief reign of her other brother, Emperor Ruizong. And when Emperor um, Xuanzong uh, ascended the throne, he, you know, he had to organize a coup against her and forced her to commit suicide. So she was incredibly rich, incredibly powerful, one of a set of very powerful women which uh, controlled court politics in China from Emperor Gaozong's reign to Emperor Xuanzong's reign. So for a period of mm, half a century or so at least. And a pretty nasty piece of work, they say, the Princess Taiping was not a virtuous or, or nice lady. So here, the emperor is visiting her. And again, well, it's early spring, we've got the season, and the poets are commanded, make a nice poem to commemorate this party. Other poets that composed, uh, um, that composed poems for this group 
uh, we're not going to read them, obviously, but all the big names of court poetry, Su Ting, Shen Chuan Qi, Song Ji Wen, Li Yi, Li Yong, uh, Xiao Shang. So this poem is a court poem, banqueting. It uh, follows the, the indications I mentioned above. It will describe the scenery. It has this specific element of the emperor arriving, which it will also indicate in in different images. And uh, it ends with uh, the sadness at the need to, to part. Um, let's take a look. Uh, so, so that's the topic. Banqueting, an imperial visit, luxurious house, wonderful natural setting. Um, this is the court taken from the palace to this villa, so courtly accoutrements like um, beautiful clothes, uh, soldiers, etc., music, celebration, and so on. So, first couplet. Our host's mountain mansion appears, touching the very sky. The sun of heaven on spring excursion comes, shaking the earth. So, as we said, the first couplet gives us the background. We already know from the title what's happening. The emperor is visiting the southern villa of the princess Taiping. So the first couplet starts with the arrival. We might imagine that Li Jiao is coming in the emperor's cortege. He is coming to this southern villa. I don't know where it is, but southern villa might have been south of, well, but where? Well, well south of, of Chang'an, you have the the Chungnan Mountains, perhaps it was close there. The the couplet and the poem clearly indicate that the poem that the this southern villa was in some sort of elevation, maybe at the top of a hill or a mountain. But maybe it's close to Luoyang, I don't know. But anyway, uh, the Imperial Cortege is arriving, and the first line, the first image, is the mansion appearing, as if it were some fairy land castle or or, or supernatural. Taoistic palace of, or paradise. The first images of this mountain mansion appearing, and it's so high it seems to be touching the sky. It's a mountain mansion, and so the mountain connotes those elements of retreat and retirement, but it's the, the palace of a princess, so there is that ambivalent. But that, it, that will include beautiful sights in nature, but also the world of, of opulence and... Uh, and um, the riches of the court. The first couplet in, in one of these poems, this is a heptasyllabic poem, by the, well, by the way, it could be a hepta, it could fit into the mold of a heptasyllabic regulated poem. The first couplet doesn't have to be parallelistic, but it feels parallelistic in the translation. I have the translation here, uh, and even with the characters, it looks pretty parallel, because, for example, the first one has princess with the character for princess and uh, mountain and in, in the second line Tianzu son of heaven and uh, spring so mountain goes with spring princess goes with son of heaven and uh, cloud touching at the end goes with earth shaking in the second line so I, th I think the first couple is parallelistic so you have this image, there's the host's mountain mansion on the top, and that's fixed, it's unmoving, and it's high, and the sun of heaven on spring excursion comes shaking the earth. Look at the contrast, like the house is unmoving, the emperor is moving. Uh, the, the, the mansion is a mountain mansion, so mountain, which connects with earth, but, but that is parallelistic with the sun of heaven, which is one of the titles of the emperor, who is coming and uh, uh, touching the very sky, so the sky, the elevation, the air, and uh, comes shaking the earth, the emperor, in the, in the, in the second line. So there's this, inverse, this, this reversal of mountain heaven, where the first line has the earth element and the second line, the celestial element, but at the end of the, of the lines, they reverse this. The first line ends with sky, and uh, with, with the, the very sky, and the second line ends with the earth. So, you know, very this sort of very crafty, wise choice of words and inversions, this is the sort of thing that court poets do very well, very elegant, very polished, um, very fancy, and very witty, but also elegant and restrained in some ways. Anyway, so the first couplet, 
The house appears, it's there on top of the hill, and the emperor's cortege is moving towards it with the emperor himself there. And it's a big cortege, lots of people, so much so that their procession feels like an earthquake, like uh, the earth seems to be, okay, the poet has been obviously a little bit hyperbolic, the earth seems to shake under the footsteps of this big imperial cortege. Second couplet. Here and there see horse guards circle beyond the flowers. Rainbow banners flap in the breeze, turning beside the sun. So we begin with the descriptive and parallelistic couplets. So we get a zoom in. What's the first thing we see? Well, we basically see the cortege that is mentioned in, 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 in the second line that is implied to be approaching. This cortege is focused through two elements, the horse guards and the rainbow banners. So in the cortege that follows the emperor, well, there, will, there would be soldiers, there would be an armed guard, uh, horse guards riding, and uh, there, there would be flags and pennants in the air, colorful flags, rainbow banners, as described here. And they are described in this uh, second couplet in situ. So, horse guards, they're here and there, all around. They're circling beyond the flowers. So, we might imagine that in the middle of this, uh, this mountain mansion, there is a big garden surrounding it, going around it. Around the garden and around the flowers are, you know, the, the escorts, the soldiers of the emperor. Uh, so, so, the contrast is here, of course, between the cortege and the military, the, the, the human aspect, versus the natural. So the social, the guards, versus the flowers, which are the natural. Uh, rainbow banners flap in the breeze, turning beside the sun. So the rainbow banners are fluttering, there's a little bit of a breeze. And uh, just as the guards are circling beyond the flowers, the banners are turning beside the sun. Uh, and this is a you know, very rigid parallelism. Uh, this is describing a natural phenomenon. I mean, the poet could have looked and seen those flags shaking and thinking, oh, yeah, look, they're, they're, they're turning next to the sun. But again, you could view the sun also symbolically here, like the emperor is like the sun. So the flags are around the emperor. A third couplet, which is the second parallelistic couplet, have this stony rill playing concert with the tunes of the lute and take red clouds from peaks to fill our cups of wine. So now the, the second couplet, also descriptive, but it's, it's like zooming in. So we get in the previous couplet a general view of the garden and of the guards and the flags around it. The third couplet, which generally has to be the wittiest and, and uh, well, well, the end has also, the last couplet also has to try to be pretty witty. So this third couplet is showing us the party. Very briefly, just two lines, two heptasyllabic lines, 14 characters. Describe me the party. And then probably in this couplet, or in the previous one, uh, words like wine, music, would have been expected. How does Li Zhao handle it? Again, just as in the previous couplet, we had this juxtaposition of the, the courtly, the social, like the gods and the banners, and the natural, the flowers and the sun. Here, we have a depiction of pleasure, which is basically music and drinking, and enjoying the landscape. Uh, but uh, we, we get the juxtaposition in each line between an element of nature and an element of uh, culture and society. So the first line, have this stony rill playing concert with the tunes of the lute. Where a stony rill is, you know, the, like, the, like the melodious, pleasant sound that water makes when it falls on rocks. So we might imagine there is uh, some sort of a river or rivulet uh, going through the park and it has some rocks in it. The lovely sound of the water, um, you know, uh, going over the rocks is imagined or is asked to make a harmony, to make concordance with a cultural sound. That's a natural sound. Cultural sound, the tunes of the lute. So in this locus amoenus, in this wonderfully nice party with all the nice people drinking and enjoying, one of the pleasures is music, and there is this fusion between the lovely sounds of the water over the rocks and the sounds of the chin, of the thither. And they actually 
uh, are meant to merge, to, to, to play in concert with each other, to harmonize, enjoy. Uh, so there's music, the next line, drinking, and take red clouds from peaks to fill our cups of wine. So they're drinking wine, but they're also looking at nature. Now the nature image is the red clouds on top of the peaks, and uh, the cultural element is uh, the wine. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, there's a certain wittiness in this image, in, in this couplet. They're taking the clouds for filling the cups, uh, so, so red clouds were one of the wondrous foods supposed to confer long life. So Li Jiao has here the imperial party imbibing them through their reflections in the wine. Yeah, this is a typical courtly poetry wittiness. Like the, the, the poets have the cups of wine with wine inside. Uh, the red clouds seem to reflect on the, li on, on the wine. So by drinking from the cup... The, the poet and the other courtiers are drinking the red clouds from the cups of wine. Okay, uh, fourth and last couplet. The bird-belled coach has left the aisles of magpies and of rooks, yet sounds of their piping still swirls around Phoenix Terrace. So the poem ends with the with the departure of the of the emperor after the party is over the emperor leaves and the guests will also leave but as it were uh, a vague element of a vague, not aroma because of the perfume but a vague sound remains of the imperial presence the imperial carriage would have had some special bells and ornaments so when it left it would have tingled and made some nice sound so the, the imperial carriage has left, the bird-belled coach has left the isles of magpies and Roo, of rooks. Or what we might imagine there might have been a little pond with some birds in, 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 in this state, although you know, they could be imagined as well, or the rooks and magpies might, might symbolize the courtiers or the people enjoying the party. But uh, the bird-belled coach has left, the sounds of the bells twinkling, twinkling, are still swirling around Phoenix Terrace. Phoenix Terrace is a fancy name that is being given to this mansion, probably a name with references to legends and stories. There was this legend about um, the daughter of the Duke of Chin who um, played the song of the Phoenix on, on palm pipes and, and that way she summoned a Phoenix and went away on its back. So, uh, could be a reference to that, or, or, well, or, or to other things as well, you know, those, those images of, um, of, of, of departing from beautiful places, a period in Taoist poetry, recreating these um, paradises of the immortals. But anyway, the idea is the emperor, who is like an immortal, who is like a denizen of heaven, has returned and uh, left this place, which he visited for a minute. And that's it. So overall, it's not a bad poem. Very, very, very representative of this type of poetry, of court poetry of the early time.